Okay, we're starting. So, last time we started attacking the area problem um, by figuring out how to find the area under a curve. We use three approximation methods, the right-hand rule, the left-hand rule, the midpoint rule, and we sort of ended on this um, with uh, this very important idea that if you take a Riemann sum, which means, you know, if you take the um, f of x1 times delta x plus f of x2 times delta x plus da 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 plus f of x n times delta x, and this is an approximation for area under curve. If we, in this guy, take the limit as n approaches infinity, we get what we call the exact area under the curve. Under in quotations here. And we had a notation for that was this symbol, which we call the definite integral of f of x. symbol basically means you're geometrically what it means is you're finding the um, integral of a function between a and b. Geometrically what that means is you're finding the area of the curve under the area under the curve on the integral a and b. And so that's sort of where we, we ended up with. Um, here's, here's an important fact. this fact in general, it requires some algebra, but I don't want to waste the time to do it. Um, so I'll just kind of illustrate to you this idea that I'm going to write on the board. It's a very important idea. Um, and I'm going to use the, the example that we've actually used before, the same thing <coughs> that we kind of started off our study with derivatives about. You might have remembered this guy, where we were talking about the distance traveled by some object. Um, I believe we measured it in miles. And over here we had time, which we measured in hours, and we one, two, and then we said that after two hours it traveled a distance of 80 miles. And you might have remembered what we kind of said here was we found the slope of this line, and that was actually it was miles per hour. And then we interpreted that as speed, and so then from that we talk about, oh, okay, we can use the slope of a straight line to, to refer to velocity or speed, and then that started the whole derivative thing, which is why we're here now up to this point. Okay? But I want to actually look at something else here. So that's the example that really sparked our study of derivatives. And I'm going to use that same example. Well, a little, we're going to look a little more. We're going to go a little deeper. Now consider the velocity. Right, which 
just speed, basically. If, if it, speed with direction and bond. What would that graph look like here? So let's say here I'm plotting the velocity. Yeah? It'd be a horizontal line. It'd be a horizontal line. Why? Oh, well, what would it pass through, first of all? 40. 40. So this was our example. We saw that the speed was 40. That's the velocity. And because it's a straight line, it means that it's constant. So the speed is constant. We have something that's moving at a constant speed of 40 miles per hour, and it's traveling that way for two hours straight. So the velocity graph will literally just be a horizontal line that it will maintain for two hours. Question. What is the area under the velocity graph? Which, let me call this V of T. Right, and this is the position graph. We had a notation for that S of T. What's the area under this graph? So if I were to measure the area of this guy. Yeah. Give me distance travel. Well, what? It's 80. Yeah, right. 80. Right? And if I were asking you to, the question you actually answered, if I asked you to interpret 80 here, what would the answer be? Well, it's the distance problem. Now, one thing I wanted to point out here is this is not a coincidence. Not a coincidence. Um, I also want to point out, note what we're saying. <coughs> is in the notation that I introduced last class, if I find the area under the velocity graph from the point where t equals 2 to t 0 to 2, that is the same as taking my position function evaluated at 2 minus the position function evaluated at zero. If I find the change in distance, it actually gave me the same value as the area under the velocity graph. And my claim to you is that that's not a coincidence. Um, something like this actually will always happen. Now, after, now I'm going to talk about what do I mean by something like this. Let's make that more specific. Let me start with the definition. Let f of x be a differential function. Or uppercase f be a differential function. Answer is little f. Then f of x is called an antiderivative. Of the little so I'm defining the phrase for you antiderivative. So that's the second thing that showed up in the title of this section. The section was integrals and antiderivative. We already know what an integral is. It's just a way to talk about the area under a curve between two points. And now I'm going to define for you what an antiderivative is. It's just some function that when you, it's the, an, the antiderivative of a function is that function that you have to differentiate to get the function. Okay, so example. S of t is an antiderivative. 
of v of t. Why? If I differentiate s of t, I get v of t, right? That, that we already know, right? So if I know that if s was my position function, we looked at this before, um, then if I differentiate s, that gives me v of t, which is velocity. I also know that if I differentiate velocity, that gives me a of t, which is acceleration. So to actually move down in this list, we differentiate it. So what I'm saying now is I'm introducing a term that, that defines going the other way, saying we can anti-differentiate. can actually talk about things in the reverse order, right? So I can talk about this guy being the antiderivative of this guy, and this guy is the antiderivative of that guy. So to go from here to here, I say I differentiate. To go from here back to there, I say I anti-differentiate. I can reverse the process. There should at least be some way you might think in theory to reverse the process, because we actually can do this using formulas. There's a strategic it means something to go from here to here. There's a formula that we can follow, like a power rule or something like that. So it's like, if I could do this rule to get here, why couldn't I undo the rule to go back, right? And it turns out that there are, you can't always do that, but there are many times where you can. And in the case that you can, you say we can find an antiderivative of a function. If I have a function that I can reverse a derivative rule and get back something else, I can say I find the antiderivative of that function. Um, here's an example. Let's see if you guys get it. What is an antiderivative of? C. Why do you think you put a plus C? Uh, so like when we take that under the uh, when we take that the rule that we ignore the first uh, what's it called the initial value like uh, number five. So if for example we have x squared plus five, we take okay. the rule that we have two x plus zero. Sure. Okay. So in in the strictest definition. This is an antiderivative of 2x because if I differentiate that, I get 2x. But also, this is an antiderivative of 2x because if I differentiate that, I get 2x. Right? And I can have that's an antiderivative of 2x. So I differentiate that, I get 2x. I have this. Right? If I have that, differentiate that, I still get 2x. So the idea here is that antiderivatives aren't unique there might always be a plus constant. So once you can find some antiderivative, you can assume that there might have been some constant there that when you differentiate it died, right? So this leads to another definition. And this is kind of why I was careful to use the word and here, and. Like there is some, right? In fact, there are multiple, right? There's no specific one. So let me talk about the general antiderivative. So, right, because there are many options here. There's an infinite number of functions who are the antiderivative of 2x. So let's talk about the general antiderivative, right? So not an antiderivative, let's talk about the antiderivative, how we consider it. So suppose f of x is an antiderivative. then the most general antiderivative of f of x is big f of x plus So 
So the idea is here, when I differentiate something, if there's just a constant, we know that the derivative of a constant is zero, so you lose that information. So to actually reverse and take the antiderivative, you always have to put a plus C just in case there was actually a value there that got destroyed when you took the derivative. So we consider this to be the general antiderivative of some function. So whenever we're de de reversing a derivative rule, we need a plus C to talk about the general antiderivative. So now I can state the important fact. Here is what our first example illustrates. Suppose f of x is a continuous function on a b and let f of x be an antiderivative of f. Then definite integral from a to b of f of x dx is equal to the antiderivative evaluated at b minus the antiderivative evaluated at a. And if I wrote down, when I wrote down the formula using v of t and s of t, you can see that this is actually what happened. Now it turns out, if you have a continuous function that has an antiderivative, this is always true. This is a fact. And it's a very important fact. In fact, it's so important that there's a fundamental in the name of the fact. This is called the fundamental theorem of this part of the course, entire, no, all of calculus. That's how important of a fact it is. It's the fundamental theorem of the study of calculus. Right? Now this theorem comes in two parts. This is actually one part of them. Um, the other part is not really important for us, but this is a part that's important for us. And this is kind of why we're here. And this is kind of why, even though mankind has been doing pieces of calculus for thousands of years, this is why Isaac Newton back in the 1700s was credited with the invention of calculus is because he and his teachers, and independently Leibniz, came up with this fact. There's a connection between derivatives and area. So while the, these two subjects were being studied separately for a long time, we thought of them as the rate problem and the area problem, and they have nothing to do with each other. People are over here figuring out how fast things are moving, and people are over here figuring out how much space things are taking up. And then someone like Newton and his teacher comes along and says, you know what? These are actually two sides of the same coin. These two problems are together. Like, if I can figure out one, I can figure out the other. I just have to flip it in reverse. It's the same problem looking from an opposite way. And that birthed modern calculus. This is what came up. This is why you have calculus class now. This is, this, this is the reason we're all here. <laughs> math, the math curriculum would have been very different if this hadn't been noticed. But it's a very important theorem and it's kind of surprising. Who would have thought that speed and area somehow had a relationship? Turns out they do and this is the relationship. A very important theorem. It also tells us, by the way, a nice little neat formula to compute the area of a function once I can find its antiderivative. So forget doing Riemann sums and adding up rectangles and then finding limits as I approach infinity, just find the antiderivative and plug in the values, and that's going to give me the area. And, by the way, <coughs> you, can, you might have recalled, 
everything we've been doing up till now, and it's and we haven't done an exhaustive study of derivatives, so believe me. But you can think of all the things we're able to do just by figuring out the slope of a straight line. You could figure out maximums and minimums when things are increasing and decreasing. You can figure out optimization problems. We can figure out related rates problems. There's a whole bunch of things that came from just us really considering what it means to take the slope of a straight line, right? In the same way, us figuring out what it means to find the area under a curve has a whole lot of consequences. There's a whole lot of things that fall out of this. Now, we won't actually see all the applications because it's a Cal 1 class and we never see that. That's Cal 2 and 3 studies that kind of thing. Um, but they usually introduce this at the end of the typical Cal 1 class. Um, but trust me, this, this here, the study of integrals, is actually a lot larger than the study of derivatives. Um, so you can kind of imagine all the things that can happen out of noticing this fact. Right? So. But we here, we're really going to focus on the area component of it. So being able to compute these guys, being able to compute antiderivatives, and finding areas is basically what we're going to look at, just the geometrical point of view. And I can also say, by the way, <coughs> this also suggests, with, a, with some tinkering, that if I were to take the indefinite integral, which again is something that we introduced last time, that that is going to be of the form big f of f. So an example we've seen before. To write this in, here is where I'm asking you for the integral of 2x, which is equivalent to me asking for the antiderivative of 2x based on the fundamental theorem of calculus. And we understood here that that was x squared plus a constant. So that's just one example. Right, an example we've seen before. Now let's, let's use this, let's do um, some computations. Okay, let's run this. Idea here is to figure out the antiderivative of f of x or the antiderivative of the definite integral of f of x dx we need to find the big f of x, which is the antiderivative. To find the big f, all we have to do is simply reverse the derivative. Turns out that the area under a graph is connected to the antiderivative of the function in question, and we can actually compute general antiderivatives or indefinite antiderivatives or indefinite integrals. Because of the fundamental theorem of calculus, we will use these as interchangeable, one and the same. Me saying, find the integral of this, find the antiderivative of this, it's going to mean the same thing. Um, so we can find the antiderivative of a function or the integral of a function by figuring out what its antiderivative is and adding a c. And in the case that I put numbers on here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in the top number into that minus plug in the bottom number into that. So knowing that to compute this, I need to find that. And to find this, I need to basically reverse the derivative rule. That leads me to a bunch of rules that come from reversing the derivative rules. So 
Here's one rule. How would I find something like that in general? Right? So we know how to do it if it's like x to the 1. Um, but what about in general? <coughs> well, we know the power rule for derivatives, right? So the power rule for derivatives says, if you want to differentiate a function like this, you bring this power down <coughs> and multiply, and then you subtract 1 from the power. So how would you reverse that process? Come again? N times x to the power of n minus 1. No, that's derivative. Like if I want to find the derivative of x to the n, that is uh, n x to the n minus 1. Here I'm talking about the integral the anti. Yeah? Um, uh, x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. Plus c. That's very important. Um, notice that this works if your n is not minus 1, because if it's minus 1, you divide by c. Um, so that's an, that's an important rule. It's called the power rule for, your, in, for your integrals. And you can notice that to compute this, I actually use that. Right? So the idea is we're reversing derivatives. Whereas in derivatives, we multiply by something and subtracted one from the power. Now we're going to divide by something and add one to the power. Um, what we're going to divide by is the power that was there before because that was the thing that we had to multiply by to find the derivative. So this guy will reverse the power rule for derivatives. So it now becomes a rule for integrals. Obviously, there is a gap here. Um, if your n is minus 1, you divide by 0. We know that's something you'd never do. So let's deal with the case that if n is minus 1. What happens if n is minus 1? Right? Let's say you have x to the minus 1. Yeah? So, no, you. Jim Jim. Jim Jim. I don't think there can be one. Because, like, if that means that you'd have x, it would, the derivative of it would be x to the 0. Because, like, to, find, to get to x minus 1, the um, anti derivative would be x, x to the 0, which would be 1. So you can't have uh, an integral with an exponential. Or, uh, Not so fast. It actually has one. Here's the trick. Think of it this way. Does that help? Is yeah. It L, isn't it ln? ln. <laughs> right? Remember the integrals come from reversing a derivative rule. So if I ask you what is the integral of 1 over x, all you have to do is think about what function did I differentiate to get 1 over x? Turns out it's ln. Um, in this case, <coughs> It's a little bit more general than that. Because here, notice that your x doesn't, it can be positive and negative in general. While in an ln, it can only take positive values inside the ln. So the rule is generalized by putting an absolute value. Right? So when you take the antiderivative of 1 over x, the result is ln of the absolute value of x. It's important to, that you have the absolute values. And before you worry about whether or not that's legal or that would work out, you don't need to worry, because that will work out because of the following observation. Um, let me just do it over this side. Notice that if I have ln of the absolute value of x, absolute value means that it breaks into two situations. So that would give me ln of x if my x is already positive. Obviously, it can't be equal to 0. But it gives me ln of minus x if my x is negative, by definition of absolute value. Now, if I talk about the derivative of this guy, it means there are two cases. There's a derivative when x is positive, and it will also give me a derivative when x is negative. Now, in the positive case, the derivative of ln x we know is 1 over x. In this case, what is the derivative? It's also 1 over x. Why do u prime over u? The derivative is minus 1 over the thing itself, and it becomes 1 over x again. 
So once you put in an absolute value, it allows you to deal with both the positive and negative side, and they all they end up giving you exactly the same answer. They will both give you one for x. And so we can now state this confidently as a rule. So the antiderivative of 1 over x is ln of the absolute value of x. What's the antiderivative of e to the x? e to the x plus c. This is why I put reverse in quotations. Not exactly the reverse because differentiation makes you lose some information, so you always have to remember the plus c. But again, you can just think, to get e to the x, I had to differentiate e to the x. So that's going to be the antiderivative. Um, there's another rule we can look at here. a to the x. That's a to the x divided by ln a. Okay. And of course, this works if your a is greater than 1. And again, you can see, if I differentiate this, I get that. So that's why that's a rule. We can also do, look at something like this. It's an observation that we can make just by differentiating the right side. Um, but technically, you would prove it using substitution, which I'm going to tell you about next time. Um, if you have a e to a constant times it, that becomes 1 over k e to the constant times x plus c, where k is a constant. In particular, if k is not a constant, this rule does not apply. The rules are very specific. Um, and hopefully, you guys realize that. Because um, one, one of the mistakes that I saw were common on test, test 2 and there are a bunch more that I probably need to actually talk about, is there was a problem where you had to differentiate something that looks like this. And I saw a lot of people try to apply this rule. Why did this rule not apply there? Yeah? Uh, x is not, uh, x cannot be considered. Because in this, a is a constant, and in here, not a constant. So the rules are specific. Don't just think, just because it kind of looks like this, I can do this rule. It's very specific. I mentioned k is a constant here. The rule only applies if k is a constant. Don't try to apply it otherwise. If you try to integrate, if you try to integrate e to the x squared by trying this, oh, just think of it as e to the x times x, and then you, you would be wrong. In fact, that's an example of a function that has no antiderivative. in case you're ever wondering. There is no function that you can think about that if you differentiate it, e to the x squared would be the result. Not something we have to worry about, but since someone mentioned that this might not have one, I thought I'd mention an example of one that has one. But the, the rules are very specific, just as they are in derivatives, so do not try to apply the rule if it doesn't actually fit. Here, n is a constant. It does not apply if n is not a constant. This only applies if the power of x is minus 1, which means if you see something like 1 over x squared, this rule does not apply. Why? Because in the rule, the power of x is 1. Here, the power of x is 2. You need to be very specific. How would you do this one? I have 1 over x squared. We can't do it. We just can't use this root. So you see 1 over x squared was the anti root. Yep. You could uh, use, make it x to the negative 2 and then use the first rule. OK. You rewrite it here as x to the minus 2. And that looks like this rule. So it's actually using the power rule. Okay. I want you guys to be aware, the rules are very specific. It only applies if the power of x is minus 1. This rule applies in that, literally that one case. In all other powers of x, use the power rule. Right? 
This rule only applies if k is a constant. In all other cases, you cannot use that. Okay. Let's do some examples. I have a bunch. We'll see how many we get through. And if not, we'll finish them up tomorrow. Not, not Friday, but on Tuesday. Friday we have the third test. So examples. A. So in the last test there will be problems where I specifically ask you to find the antiderivatives of a bunch of things. So you need to be able to recognize when to use what, how to apply these rules. We'll do as many of those examples as we can in the remaining time, and whatever is left over, we'll leave that for you. over 3 plus c, that's the answer. Let me just write this one out so you can see it. This is x to the 2 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 plus c. I just apply the power. So then hence you get x cubed plus 3 plus c. You can also notice, and this is always useful for you to check, if you differentiate this, you should get that. Notice that if you differentiate this, which, by the, how would you differentiate this? No, not quotient. Not that it's wrong, but... Yeah, it's the same as one-third x cubed. So you differentiate that, and you leave the one-third alone, and so you get x cubed. So you wouldn't do quotient rule. Try not to be as com too complicated. You always try to simplify things first. If the top or the bottom is a constant, quotient rule is usually a bad idea. Not that it's wrong, it's just it gives you a lot of room for error and a lot of people made errors using it. B. X to the 4 divided by 4 plus C. Plus C is very important here. If there are no numbers on this thing, the plus C is very important. Right. And again, it's just the power. We add one to the power, divide by the new power. You can also take note, if you differentiate this, you do get that. Here, you can also realize that the bottom is a constant, so if I want to check my uh, check what I'm doing, I would just factor out the one forward, differentiate the function, and, and do it that way. So I, I wouldn't really use the quotient. Um, what about C? Yeah. X to the one half plus one over one half plus one. Right. So again, 
You want to think of your integration rules exactly the same way you think of your differentiation rules. They are templates. You need to make sure that the problem you're looking at fits right over it. You did not have a rule that has a radical in it, which means your first step should be to think of it, rewrite it without the radical. So we know that the square root of x is x to the half. Now that looks like x to a constant power. Now it looks just like the rule. We can apply the power rule. So it's x to the 1 half plus 1 over 1 half plus 1. Now that I do expect you to simplify. I'm just showing you this intermediate step. Um, but I do expect you to realize that this is x to the 3 over 2 divided by 3 over 2. And to divide by a fraction means to multiply by the reciprocal. So you can think of this as t per x to the 3. Now, in general, you can jump from this step to that step, and that will be fine. I'm just, I'm just showing you all the steps here. Because it's, it's the first time we're doing this. And again, differentiate this. <coughs> all right, bring the 3 over 2 down. It, everyone cancels, and then subtract 1 from the power. You get x to the half. says we could do that? No, we didn't. So in fact, that is incorrect. Remember, just like with derivatives, if you have two functions being multiplied, you couldn't just differentiate each piece and stick it together. With integrals, it's obviously going to kind of be the same thing. So that doesn't work. So writing it as a product and integrating each piece actually won't work. That gives you the wrong answer in general. So you, you have to do something else here. Junji. I'm not sure, but can we separate it to two antiderivatives? So we have antiderivative of one uh, plus antiderivative of one divided by x. Yeah. So that's how we do this here. Split this into two fractions. You can split things across the, the numerator, right? You can't split fractions across the denominator, so don't think of doing that. Um, so what this now becomes is one plus one over x, and I want to find the antiderivative of that. But just like with derivatives, to actually take the integral of a sum actually works, right? To, because why are you differentiated to get these two pieces? You could have just differentiated each two pieces separately. So we can actually do that for antiderivatives as well. And so now, so again, just like with de derivatives, there is no, there is a product rule for integrals, but we're not going to cover it. That's called integration by parts. Um, but yeah, in general, if two things are multiplied, you can't just integrate each piece and stick them together. Or if two things are divided, you can't just integrate each piece and stick them together. So be careful of that. So the best thing is to try to simplify so that things fit with one of your basic rules. And so what is the antiderivative of 1? That's x. Why? Well, if I differentiate x, I get 1. It's one way you can see it. The other way is to kind of be sneaky and think of the 1 as x to the 0, and then apply the power rule. Either way, you should understand the integral of 1 is x. Um, in general, the integral of a constant will be a constant times x, right? Because if you differentiate a constant times x, plus, antiderivative of this? Absolute power rule. Ln of the absolute value plus c. I get through one more. Okay. 
we get here. Can we integrate each piece separately? Yeah, so the integral of the sum is the same as the sum of the integrals. That works. So you take them one at a time, this guy. Right. This guy we actually found already. But let's just take a step and rewrite it. One half plus, how would I do with that guy? Is that just going to end up being 3 ln of x squared? Do that. And so now this guy we already found, you add 1 to the power, 3 halves, divide by the new power, 2 thirds, plus. What happens here? Well, the 3 stays. It's anti derivative of that. need to be careful with. A lot of students, they forget the negative sign in front of this, so they'll see minus 2 plus 1, and then they'll write minus 3 or something like that. Don't make that mistake. Because only the negative, only the 2 is being negated here. So you add 1 to minus 2, you get minus 1, and so ultimately the answer is going to be 2 thirds x to the 3 over 2 minus 3 x to the minus 1. And we'll stop. So I'll see you on Friday. We have the test there. Um, technically, the test is only up to optimization. So this is like bonus material. So you can study this if you want to or not. Um, Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.